Today we're going to look at a nice problem that was proposed by Erdős. And well, it's not exactly the problem proposed by him, but it's a simplified version. And the solution was further generalized, and you can find that in the American Mathematical Monthly. But like I said, we're just going to look at the basic case because I think it's maybe the prettiest one. And so let's see what we have here. So let's say that we've got a sequence of integers, so a sub n, and they satisfy this condition where a0 is bigger than or equal to 0, and then a1 is bigger than a0, a2 is bigger than a1. In other words, it's an increasing sequence, which is all starting at a point which is bigger than or equal to 0. And then the goal is to show that the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over a sub n factorial is irrational. Now, before we get into our proof, I'd like to look at some special cases. The first case is when a sub n equals n, which is really the smallest case, because there you would have a0 equals 0. But since a1 has to be an integer bigger than 0, then a1 can at least be 1, and then so on and so forth. Well, in that case, you get this series which converges to the number e, which is well known to be irrational. And then the next case, a sub n equals 2n, well, in that case, the series converges to the hyperbolic cosine evaluated at 1. Okay, so now that we've looked at these like special cases and see how this like generalizes a really classic result, let's get into the solution. Okay, now we're ready for our proof. So we're going to do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that the sum as n goes from 0 to infinity of 1 over a sub n factorial is equal to b over c. So in other words, it is a rational number. So b and c are integers. And since we know this is positive, b and c might as well be natural numbers. And you could also take them to be co-prime. In other words, their GCD would be 1, but we don't actually need to do that here. Okay, so now let's do the following. So let's find a prime P such that it satisfies two rules. So first of all, it has to be odd. So maybe let's fit that in here just like this. So an odd prime P so that P is bigger than C. So that's all we need to do. Okay. So how do we know we can do that? Well, C is fixed and there's an infinitude of primes. There's no largest prime, so we can easily do that. Great, and then let's observe the following. So let's observe that for all n bigger than or equal to zero, A sub n is bigger than or equal to n. That's what we talked about before. That's based on the increasingness of this sequence. So well, what does that mean? Well, that means that a sub n is bigger than or equal to p for all n bigger than or equal to p. Okay, well, what do we want to do now? Well, let's take a capital N to be the minimum number such that a sub capital N plus 1 is bigger than or equal to p. Okay, so how is this possible? Well, we know that some numbers satisfy this rule that uh, you get a sub n is bigger than or equal to p, so you just collect all of those numbers, but notice that that's gonna be a subset of the natural numbers, and every subset of the natural numbers has a smallest element. Well, that's just what we're doing here. We're taking the smallest element of that subset of the natural numbers. And now notice what that gives us. That gives us this nice inequality, a sub n is strictly less than p, which in turn is less than or equal to a sub n plus one. And then why is that the case? Well, note that p has to be bigger than a sub capital N because otherwise we would not have chosen this capital N to be that minimum. But now let's notice the following. Notice that we have a couple of things going on here. First of all, we have p divides a n plus one factorial. So how do we know that? Well, a n plus one is bigger than or equal to p. So when we take its factorial, p will be one of its 
factors. That's because we've got this descending product. But then what are some other things that we know? Well, we know that P does not divide A sub N factorial, and that's based off the primeness of P. And then we can never build a copy of P by taking products of numbers smaller than it. Again, that's by the primeness of P. So another thing that we know is A sub N plus one factorial over A sub N factorial is an integer. Well, it's a positive integer, so I'll write that it's a natural number. And we know that because, well, a n plus one is bigger than a n, so when we take the factorial of a smaller number, we always get divisibility there. That's kind of a nice thing about the factorial is inequalities turn into a divisibility relationship when you apply the factorial. Okay, but these three things that we have here tells us that P divides the following difference. And that difference is that P divides the quotient of a n plus one factorial with a n factorial. Again, so that follows from the fact that we've got a natural number in the first place, which we, means we can talk about divisibility. And then we've got non-divisibility of a n factorial and divisibility of a n plus one factorial. So I'd like to point something else out. So also we have the following inequality which is expanded to include C. And that is that C is less than A sub N, which now we can put that in here, which is less than P, which is less than or equal to A N plus one. So we've got that kind of scenario as well. And well, why do we know that P is less than A and I'm actually going to leave that as a homework exercise. I think that might be something nice to work on on your own. Okay, so now let's take this information and see where it takes us. So here's a collection of the data that we have from our previous work. And now what I'd like to do is take this expression B over C and multiply it by A sub N factorial. But notice since a sub n is bigger than c, when we take its factorial, well that will include a factor of c. We used that kind of argument earlier. Okay, so let's write that down. So we've got a sub n factorial times b over c. So like I said, c will be included in this a sub n factorial. So we know that this is a whole number. We know it's positive as well, so this is a natural number. But then on the other hand, we can write this as a sub n factorial times the sum as n goes from zero to n of one over a sub little n factorial plus a remainder term. And so that remainder term is just the sum starting at n plus one and then going to infinity. Okay, now from here what we'd like to do is analyze this remainder term. So let's do that. So this remainder term, which we've called R, is equal to the sum as n goes from n plus one to infinity of one over a n factorial. That's really how it's defined. Okay, great. But notice that this first term here is a sub n plus one factorial. And well, we can factor that out. So let's do that. That's gonna leave us with one over a sub n plus one factorial times the sum as n goes from n plus one to infinity of a n plus one factorial over a sub little n factorial. So something like that. Now by the increasing nature of our sequence, we can actually get a bound on these terms right here. And that allows us to start building this inequality. So this is going to be less than 1 over a n plus 1 factorial. And then we'll have the sum as n goes from 0 up to infinity of 1 over n factorial. Now let's talk our way through that. Well, notice that this first term here is most definitely equal to one because we have a n plus one factorial over a n plus one factorial. But then we get an a n plus two factorial in the denominator. But notice that since a n plus two is at least one bigger than a n plus one, well then that's gonna give you something that is less than one over one factorial and then so on and so forth for all of these. So we end up with something like this. Oh, but this is a sum that we know. So we can write this as e over 
a n plus one factorial. Okay, good. And then we're gonna do a rougher estimate over here. So notice that this remainder is most definitely bigger than its first term. And its first term is one over a n plus one factorial. So let's see what we have. So we've got one over a n plus one factorial is less than r, which in turn is less than e over a n plus one factorial. Okay, great. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that we can find an x in the set from zero to one, where r is equal to e to the x over a sub capital N plus one factorial. And that's simply because this represents the case when x is zero, and this represents the case when x is one, and then e to the x, well, it's like an onto function on the interval from zero to one between one and e. But now let's make one more little argument before we move on to a clean chalkboard. And that is, if we take this object right here, multiplied into this object right here, we most definitely get an integer. And that, I think that's pretty clear because we're multiplying by like a larger factorial. So that implies that if we take this object right here, this a n factorial, and multiply it into the r, we also get an integer. Because, well, the whole thing is an integer. So what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that this expression, which is e to the x over a n plus one factorial, is itself an integer. So let's see where that takes us. So this is where we ended up. This expression a sub n factorial over a sub n plus one factorial times e to the x is an integer where x is between zero and one. And that follows from this thing that we wrote down earlier that a n factorial times r was an integer, but this is exactly a n factorial times r. Okay, now where do we go from here? Well, let's notice that this object right here is a multiple of one over p. And what do I really mean by a multiple of one over p? Well, notice that its reciprocal is a multiple of p. But if its reciprocal is a multiple of p, then that means that you should be able to factor a one over p out of this, where there are no p's left in the remaining expression. Oh, okay, but what does that tell us? Well, since there are no p's left in the remaining expression, after pulling the one over p out of this, that means that the p must be inside of e to the x. So in other words, we have e to the x over p is an integer. So like I said, e to the x over p is an integer. But that tells us that p divides e to the x. But since everything is positive here, that means that p is less than or equal to e to the x. Oh, but where does that put us? Notice that x comes from zero to one, but that means that e to the x is less than e. So what do we have now? Well, we've got p is a prime which is less than e. But then how many primes are there less than e? Well, notice that e is like 2.718. So there's a single prime less than p, which is p equals two. But from our original assumption, we had that p was an odd prime. And it was an odd prime that was bigger than c. Well, the bigger than c part was for the little homework exercise that I gave you. And what we got here is the contradiction to the oddness of p. Any way you see it, we've got a contradiction. But what did we contradict? Well, our original assumption that this expression was a rational number, which means it must in fact be an irrational number. Finishing the proof. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you wanna get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.